1976, the manager of the Sex Pistols came on the telly and said, never trust a hippie. So of course, I didn't. But over the years, I've definitely warmed to the hippie passion for good food. Food was really central to the whole hippie thing, mate. It was the, the central agenda to the whole counterculture, the counter cuisine. John Downsmith spent his youth in America in the 70s and totally fell for that hippie pastime. Yup, eating cereal. If food is central to hippie culture, well, cereal is central to food and always has been since ancient times. John, a highly regarded wood oven baker, now makes his own cereals and they're fantastic. It's the goods, you know, it's not the pretend thing in the big box. Yeah. It's based on brown rice. It's got organic coconut oil in it, goji berries, dates, papayas. It's very, very lightly roasted at a low temperature. We do that to create the culinary effect, you know, the taste and the cluster technology. Cluster technology? <laughs> yeah. I like this, cluster technology. So this is your whole life's kind of hippie theory in a bowl, really, isn't it? Well, in a way, you're right, yeah. Actually, you could distill me into this, OK? That and a coffee, and I could sit here all day, mate. Well, can I join you? Yeah. <laughs> hey, sounds good. So this cluster technology business, I need to know, John. You're going to have to walk on the wild side to Hippieville to be able to get cluster technology. It's in the vibe. <laughs> <laughs> Maggie, I ate this chocolate muesli years ago and I got a bit carried away to find who it is. And John's thing is it's not muesli, it's a granola style cereal, which is a different sort of thing. And I've got these beautiful biodynamic oats, so I'm going to knock up a granola style cereal out of them. Well, because I knew you were using these beautiful oats, biodynamic, I decided that I'd take a leaf out of your book and make a bread using the oats, but this isn't one of these beautiful ethereal loaves, let me tell you. It's dense, but this bread is for toasting to have with cheese. Oh, yummy. I'm just using dried yeast because that's more accessible for everybody. It's just the powdered yeast, sugar and warm water, and that's 10 minutes. And see, it's really a foam. Yeah. So that's the yeast ready to go. So I'm going to start with my unbleached flour. I really wanted to use rye, and I have, but rye is hard to use. You know, there's no great amount of lift here. Yeah, but and with the oat as well. And with the oat dragging it down, this is wholemeal. So, white wholemeal and rye? White wholemeal and rye and oats. And then fennel seed. Yummy. I love fennel seed. And now I've got a bit of salt. I love these things that you throw everything in. Lots of raisins. I soak them overnight to plump them up. I have olive oil. Could use butter, melted butter. My orange zest, and I've got lots of it, I know, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> why not? Now, the yeast first. Warm milk. There's something about fruit and yeast together that smells. It's already starting to waft up. It is. It's like vintage. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a beautiful it's, smell. It is the smell of vintage. Yeah. OK, now that I've got all this mixed, I want to put it back because the kneading is a slow process, so it's only just on on the mixer. About 10 minutes at this pace. OK, well, I've got to very much throw in the one-pot wonder sort of theory as well, Maggie. The oats, well, we all know they're fantastic, and there is actually an unsteamed one on the market, but if you do buy it, you have to use it within about two months because it's not stable, but it is beautiful. It's a very nice product. So that's four cups. What's going to happen is some sugars, and they're in the form of a grape nectar, a manuka honey, and organic palm sugar are going to coat the clusters of oats and make these little clumps. And that's the, the theory behind the granola-style muesli. Okay. So that's what gave them the crunch. And when I thought about making this cereal, I thought about all my favourite flavours. I wanted something... See, I'm not really a healthy guy at breakfast, so I wanted something <laughs> that was slightly medicinal. Too many black coffees. I'm a coffee guy. So I've got eight cups of coffee. <laughs> So I thought I could get my coffee into my muesli. And then I got thinking about 
the old Aztec thing about real cocoa, unsugared, just pure, you know, ground up okay. cocoa and vanilla as a very classic flavour combination and quite grown up on the palate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to chuck the cocoa in with the oats and then a bit of wattle seed because that's got that beautiful coffee flavour. So that's a, a tablespoon of roasted ground wattle seed. The manuka honey, that's very healing and medicinal and I think we all know the properties. And for the morning it's perfect. Oh, perfect. You do need a bit of a sugar rush in the morning, so hopefully this will do With that. With the amount of coffees in there, it's not going to be hard to wake up. <laughs> OK, this is a packet of muesli I'm making, not just one serve. The grape nectar is interesting because it is a sugar but it has an incredibly low GI so I'm on team grapes with you Maggie. <laughs> and then what I need to do is moisten the oats or we'll get nowhere. So orange juice, that's a cup of orange juice. And my eight shots of espresso just to give you the, <laughs> the real the wake up. <laughs> it's not the sugar that gives you the kick, it's the coffee. <laughs> and the two tablespoons of organic coconut palm sugar. And you're going to bake this? I'm going to bake it and I'm, Maggie, I'm going to bake it for as long as I can, as low as I can, because I'm not trying to colour the oats, I'm trying to form clusters. Okay. And the vanilla. Uh, Two vanilla pods. This is going to be the most extravagant breakfast you've ever been to. And I've also got some oils. So we've got some extra virgin olive oil and we all know how good that is. <laughs> and Omega 3, 6 and 9, vitamins A and E, which is almond oil. And it gives it a bit of mouthfeel because cereal type grains can be a bit dry. And that's looking perfect. So we've got flake coconut. And these are an Aldinga almond. So I've just pounded those lightly mm. with a mortar and pestle. And I reckon four hours at 80 degrees should be perfect. So I'll just pop that in an oven now, Maggie. And when I pull that back out, I add the fruit. Well, I'm going to go ahead with my bread. It's had 10 minutes of kneading. You can see it's really quite sticky, quite unlike a normal bread dough. Oh, it smells great. But it's got beautiful aromas. It's beautiful. So in just pulling this together, I choose a bowl large enough to allow it to double. And then I just make sure that there's oil all over it and I have some cling wrap. So I just put a little bit of oil or if you use one of those sprays, you could do the same. Just so when it does come up, it's not going to stick, okay? So that's just put into a warm place out of drafts. Yep. This is one that's been two and a half hours and it's ready to punch down and knead for another five minutes. But this, I advance by a couple of hours. So that's kneaded and risen again. That's kneaded and risen again. It's lovely and springy. So I'm putting it into a really hot oven, 220 degrees for 15 minutes, yep. and I'm going to turn it down to 180 degrees, okay? And I've got one cereal that I already made, Maggie. I <laughs> made this at home. And this is the way I'd actually store it. So oh. pretend that that one that's in the oven's been four hours. I put it in a brown paper bag with some wax paper underneath and just fold the top of the bag over. I don't want it sweating, sweating up or whatever. So would you like a try? Oh, love to. OK. And like I said, this is probably two serves. It's a very this. big muesli. So Maggie's already told me she's a green bowl girl. And so what we've got here is these little sort of clusters. That's what I'm after. Now you can mix all of the fruit into the muesli, it's not a problem. I haven't got that far yet. And this is some dried cranberry and a little bit of um, some Houghton figs and some little muscatels. And then hopefully the first few mouthfuls should be quite grown up and then a few of the sugars will start knocking off into the milk. Wow. The coffee. Well, it's a lot of coffee, isn't it? <laughs> and it's a very grown-up cereal. I don't think the kids will the love chocolate this one. chocolate with the fig. Oh, and the crunch of those wonderful almonds. Oh, the almonds are probably the this hero here, aren't they? Mm. The oats are the dish, but the almonds are really coming through. Mm. How about I leave you the bag, Maggie? Done. All right, I'll pop the fruit Deals in Deals are it. done. Mm. And what are we going to do with your bread? 
Well, for my bread, what I need is some goat's cheese. Yeah? Mm-hmm. I'm a huge fan of goat's cheese, so I was thrilled to finally get the chance to visit Carla and Anne-Marie at their organic goat farm in Victoria. How many goats have you got all together? We've got about 90 at the moment. Milking 55. Yeah. And that'll go up to 70 this year. Yes, yes, I can see it. You are beautiful. <laughs> yeah. There is no doubt. <laughs> The fondness these guys have for their animals is just so evident. This is the milking herd. Every bit as friendly as a baby. Yes, and <laughs> hoping there'll be some little tidbit. They like a bit of panning, don't they? Yeah, they love it. <laughs> They're very affectionate and yeah. loving animals. Well, I can't wait to get in the cheese room and see it happening. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I actually am a great believer that goat's cheese is the most exciting cheese in Australia. Well, they look pretty good to me. Okay, I love this. The ash. We've got some wood yeah. ash on there. Some La Luna barrels that are just about ready to be wrapped, ready for eating. And this is a larger version, the La Luna ring. Eat it at four or five weeks and it'll be dense, intense, really big flavour. But do you eat the rind? Because, you know, people are divided. They are. For example, I will eat the rind, but Carla will consistently cut the rind off. Fresh milk is sweet. If you set it immediately to curd, you capture that. You capture the life of the milk. I get really excited when I meet producers who approach their craft with so much passion and belief. We milk the goats twice a day and we make cheese from fresh milk every day of the week. I wouldn't bother making cheese if I couldn't milk the goats and I wouldn't have goats if I couldn't farm organically. The landscape's beautiful and I want to look after it. People that farm goats, whether it's for milk or, or for meat, they seem to be so connected to their animals. It's funny, isn't it? It's fantastic, but the cheese they are making, um, it's fabulous. I was just so thrilled with the whole visit. So I'm taking this beautiful bread. It's a bit fresh to cut, but... Let's give it a shot. And the crust. Oh, yeah. We need some... Bit of olive oil. <laughs> I was going to say butter. Mm. Oh, that's great. Oh. Doesn't need oil. It's good. So I'm using croutons of this fruit bread. Yeah. And I'm going to make a salad with figs and lardons of bacon and rocket and walnuts. Oh. But I see lots of the same cheese here. I've got a matured one from where you went. Mm hmm Country Victoria. Fantastic. Very, very subtle. I'm not, I haven't actually tasted it yet, but I'm going the full Monty here, Maggie, and I do <laughs> apologise. We're going back to the 80s. And I actually really like these little guys until they put them on everything, including desserts and, you know, with biscuits and everything. This is a very good quality se semi-dried tomato and I'm going to do a basil, goat's cheese, semi-dried tomato, ravioli or agnoletti or something to do with a parcel. So, Sounds yeah. Sounds good. But it's all yours for now, Maggie. Well, I'll just start. I've got the croutons of this fruit bread and I'm going to brush it with butter and put it into the oven to toast. About 200 degrees for about five minutes, just to crisp it a little. OK. So, yours now. Oh, OK. Well, look, um, Maggie did a beautiful pasta dough on the show. I think we've done a couple. Mm -hmm. And the recipe will be on the web. 200 grams of flour, one whole egg, one whole egg yolk and a splash of water. I've got my dough made and it's okay. bulletproof and that's right. important with a parcel. And I've got my mix, which is fairly simple. It's a, a bucket of basil ripped up. <laughs> Because I think basil and goat's cheese. Absolute must. And yeah, lemon yeah. zest and goat's cheese. Okay. And pepper and goat's cheese. I mean, it doesn't get any... And dried tomatoes and goat's yeah. cheese. Yeah. The cheese has just been chunked up a bit. I want some texture there. And I love the end bits. 
Ah, now that's interesting because the end bits really are a casing and it's not everyone that eats the end bits. Do you throw them? <laughs> Depends how mature they are. <laughs> I love it. Depends how stinky they are. Yeah. <laughs> this one's pretty good. This one's quite subtle and nice. But because of the subtlety, I want a bit of a driver. So I've got about a quarter, say a quarter of a cup of parmesan. You know, it's surprising how many people are nervous of goat's cheese, Why? and it is the most beautiful cheese. Oh, I look think... at a goat in the eyes and you could never be nervous again, could you? <laughs> and semi-dry tomatoes. You could rip these up, work on about one piece per parcel, and this is where I need your advice. Okay. I reckon it'll suit a nice, big, sized package. What do you reckon? Absolutely. I wouldn't do little because you've got too many big pieces. You need one big serve, don't you? That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. And I need a big piece, so I just dust this off a little bit. Bust it quickly down. That piddly little roller. Oh, don't pick oh. on my roller. <laughs> I had a broom handle last year and someone's bought me a beautiful little noodle roller. Maggie. <laughs> I'm just little. in case. Just oh, in case. Oh, as a backup. Yeah. I'm just going to whack this through the rollers and I'm being a bit ambitious here but this will bounce back a fair bit because I've pushed it through impatiently. I'm being a bit rough and that's halfway there and I will use that one later but I've taken one to here and it's not bad. No, it's, it's pretty good and it gives you a security blanket because it's... That's <laughs> what I'm after really, Maggie. That really is it's, what I'm it's after. It's not going to pierce through, yeah. So we'll get rid of this little yeah. guy. Okay. And I'll just let that dough rest. And it's all yours, Maggie. I'll just rescue my bread from the oven. I really just wanted to toast it a little, just a little bit golden. And that will go back into the oven with the goat's cheese later. But for the moment, I'm going to put on both the figs and the bacon. You tell me as a chef, there's a way of describing that size. In classical French cookery, Maggie's done ten lardons in one. But I wouldn't okay. expect any less from, from Maggie. We know that I'm into largesse, OK? I have a hot pan here. And I'm just putting it on a dry pan and it will render. If you don't have fresh figs, this would be lovely with dried figs that were reconstituted, oh, yeah. but still grilled. They're cut in half and a little bit of salt in the olive oil and straight onto a hot grill, cut side down. I don't mind if the figs burn a little because that caramelization will mm. just aid the flavor so much. But these, they've just a little way to go on the other side and then I'll put them onto paper. And I'm just flipping the figs over. That's what I'm after, that lovely caramelization so it's over to you. Oh, OK. Well, I've been cheating a little bit, Maggie. <laughs> Normally I do these fussy little tidy things, but I've done these jumbos because nothing really needs to warm through. I'm quite happy if the pasta's just cooked and the mix is just like that. And basically a bit of egg white just yeah. helps them seal up and just pop your lids on. Two things are important, the seal. And second is I hate eating a double thickness mm -hmm. on the edge of my pasta. I want the same texture through the whole ravioli. Whenever I eat a pasta and it's double texture on the outside, I just think amateur. Yes, me too. <laughs> me too. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> so, the monster raviolis. I normally don't oil my water for pasta, but I do for ravioli because I don't want them sticking. OK. Um, so I salt it. It's walnut oil, you don't mind? No, not at all, anything. <laughs> I just don't want two surface areas of these two to stick. So get a rapid boil, pop it in, and I'd say about three minutes. And once you get a decent amount of... Seasoning's not the right word, but... You setting. Know, setting of yeah. the day, flip them over. And, Maggie, I've got to make a sauce for these. All right. I've gone right back to California in the 80s with my semi-dried tomatoes. My goat's cheese, I'm going to actually add pine nuts. The pine nut is chock full of protein, high in fibre, and the nut with the highest source of omega-6. It's like a little creamy coloured nutrient pill. Pine nuts have this distinct resinous flavour and aroma, and for a good reason. They're actually the seeds from the cones of various species of pine. The most common one is Pinus pinea, the Italian stone pine. The seeds are carried on the scales of the cone, which takes three years to mature. 
Once the cones are harvested, they're threshed to get the seeds out and then the kernels are hulled. It's a bit of a process and it explains why they're not cheap to buy. What I really like about pine nuts is their mealy texture and the fact that they work so well in many dishes because their oils help to carry the flavour of all the other ingredients. I said I wanted pine nuts, a bit of butter, nut brown. Sounding like Maggie all day today, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> I like it, I like it. <laughs> a lot of very coarsely ground black pepper. Sprinkle of sea salt. A lot of lemon zest. Now, I love fried parsley. I absolutely love it. Okay. And a touch of olive oil just to get this moving, because the, the butter's brown enough for me, so it's kind of allowed the parsley to fry without overcooking the butter, I guess is one way of saying it. And then stop it. And then just pop your ravs out. And they'll probably be three or four minutes. Just set is what you're after. And we haven't had any disasters, which is quite good. No, of course not. No leakages. <laughs> OK, well, while you're doing that, I've taken the goat's cheese rounds. I had a cylinder here. And on my already toasted fruit bread, I'm going to pop this into the oven for probably only about two minutes. And then I'll make my vinaigrette and get um, ready. Now, because I'm using walnuts, I'm using walnut oil. Um, and I find verjuice and walnut oil is beautiful together. But you could use lemon juice, but don't use a wine vinegar. You want the acidulant to shine through but not take over the walnuts. And you the think the wine vinegar will take I over? I think the wine, unless it was a champagne vinegar, OK? That would probably do it. Sometimes when I use verjuice, I also use a squeeze of lemon juice just to up the acidulant just a bit. I've kept these warm. That's great. Now, this is my kind of a salad. I'm lucky enough to have someone who grows rocket for me. And Ooh. it is absolutely fantastic. I want that pepperiness against the creaminess of the goat's cheese. And it's a great combo, isn't it's it? It's a fantastic combo. So I'll just wait a few minutes. Oh, well, I can another plate minute those. or so. Okay. So I've got my ravs, I've got my sauce. And it is one of those dishes when I was saying about not worrying about cooking the inside mix, that you can be very blase about your serving time and I, I quite like that you know that's been sitting there for a little while and that one's wrinkled up a bit because it was sitting in the wrong position it doesn't really matter so the finishing touches the mix is fairly dry so it's going to need this pine nuts should help carry the flavor along bit of parmesan bit of pepper and of course a squeeze of lemon there is lemon zest in the mix, but it's not going to cut through all of that oil. You know, that tip about having the edges super thin so it was a single thickness... It is, is quite important. so important. Mm. I feel like I'm in the 80s, but... <laughs> it is a good one, isn't it? Mm. That combination, the lemon zest in it, mm. but the goat's cheese. I'm going back in for the goat's cheese. So I won't hear the anything, pine nuts. anything bad said about sun-dried tomatoes. Good sun-dried tomatoes, They're not in ones. that yucky oil. They'll come back. Everything comes back. <laughs> They'll be regarded as really cool one day. <laughs> I'm getting mine out. OK. So I'm ready to serve too. So it just... Um, straight out of the oven, I am just going to drizzle a bit of walnut oil on top. Now, for me, the goat's cheese are the absolute hero. So I want them to be really, really visible. But I do want the pieces of fig. It's all about those beautiful things that all go together. And the miniaturised ladons. <laughs> well, I shouldn't have asked you that question, should I? I love it. <laughs> and walnuts. Now, the vinaigrette and even though I've got bacon there, a little bit of salt does work. Mm. And pepper. That's me. I reckon this is really good, because I wouldn't have thought of figs, bacon, croutons, goat's cheese. Fruit, fruit. Need a bit more. And if that. you don't have fresh figs, 
as I said, dried figs. Plumped up. Plumped up, reconstituted and grilled as well. But all those flavours together. But really, mm. the goat's cheese. That was great. Mm. And I think this big caramel on the fig is just working so but, well. You know, I could have the goat's cheese just like that and love it. Yeah. Mm. I think you've done the goat's cheese proud. Even <laughs> genius. <laughs> <laughs>